you so much for joining us today. I'm Amy Kennedy, and I have a fantastic panel for a discussion with Mental Health America's Regional Policy Council meeting on deflection to prevention, a focus on youth. My own experience as a public school teacher and as a parent really builds my interest in what we're gonna to discuss today because we know even before the pandemic, mental health was at epic levels in our schools and yet we're so poorly trained, often teachers like myself feel at a loss at how we can address this for our students, even though it's the most critical need. And yet today we're joined by Dr. Art McCoy, former superintendent of Jennings, Missouri School District and St. Louis University Distinguished Fellow, most recently under Dr. Art McCoy's leadership in the 2018-2019 school year, Jennings made Missouri history as the only as the only performing at the accredited with distinction range on the Missouri Accreditation Annual Performance Report, regardless of over 90% minority and 90% of students on free and reduced meals. That is an incredible record and achievement. And we also joined by Dr. Bernadia Johnson, former superintendent of Minneapolis, Minnesota School District and current assistant professor Department of Educational Leadership at Minnesota State University. So lots of things to discuss today. And I'm so happy to um, have you both on. I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit more about the demographics of your school district, Dr. McCoy, and kind of how we, how we got here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you and all of our guests and leaders. Uh, so my school district has uh, literally 98% African-American population, 1% Hispanic, 1% Caucasian, and we have 100% of students on free meals. And ultimately, don't let that data define us. We, we were a promise zone, but we ultimately had 100% graduation rates uh, for two years in a row and 97% for four years. So I was there for six years, and we've had 100% career and college placement of our students. Frankly, as a superintendent, I use the promise zone data of dropout rates, uh, birth pregnancy rates of youth and, and unemployment as my ruler for success to end that. Uh, and so we are success zone uh, as opposed to a promise zone now because of the success of our students and the hard work of our staff. We are a small school district. Uh, so this is the smallest district that I've led. This, this district has 3,000 students from pre-K through 12. My former district in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Ferguson, Florida, 14,000 students, 80% minority, and the district before that, 22,000 students. But the key is mental health education and trauma-informed practices. And we instilled that throughout all of our schools and in the region, and it made a significant difference. So I look forward to talking more about those practices. Thank you. That's really interesting to talk about the size and the scale of the way you're able to implement that. So I'll look forward to hearing more. Uh, Dr. Johnson, could you tell us a little bit about the demographics of where you work? Yes, I was, I'm was. i the former superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools. And when I was in Minneapolis, we had about 36,000 students. 70% of those students were students of color and about a third are ELs. And then we had a really large highly homeless and highly mobile population, as well as a large percentage of our students being referred to special ed. I would say that we had the distinction, not the honor of having one of the largest achievement gaps, not only in Minnesota, but probably across this country for a, for a city like Minneapolis that has the wealth that it has. Though we've started to see some changes in trajectory of outcomes for students based on some of the policies and practices that we put in place, mostly around re changing our behavior practices, doing MOUs with our police SROs, as well as working with our in a NAMI to look at our um, mental health services and work with the community. And so uh, I also established the Office of Black Male Student Achievement because for every indicator of success, our black boys were at the bottom. For every indicator of failure, they were at the top. And so even not, I can't say that we did anything more significantly in changing graduation rates, but we did do that for that group of students. And this was like five years ago, but what I feel really blessed about is being able still to talk about the great work. And because it was good work, they're still continuing the mental health model 
in Minneapolis, and I have the opportunity to testify at the legislature quite frequently about this work, and I'm very proud of it. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to say it, but thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be here, especially with Dr. McCoy and yourself to talk about this very critical issue for our students' well-being. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. You know, if they're still asking you to testify, that Absolutely. must be two things. One, that what you did was really phenomenal work, and two, that we must still have a long way to go because they need to hear more about it. And so that's really why we're here today. We want to talk about why schools are the place that we can make real progress and a great place to address our students' mental health needs, not only for the students themselves, but for the whole family why this works and why the moment is now to really be talking about this as we're heading back in September, what kind of transformational changes could happen that have already been modeled in your districts and that we can take to scale around the country. I would love to hear a little bit from each of you about what it was like when you first came aboard. I know my experience going into uh, my first teaching assignment was that I was completely unprepared. And so as a new teacher, I was presented with all different students with challenging behaviors and diagnoses and um, issues that they brought to the classroom. And yet I was a little bit intimidated to ask for help. I didn't want that to be a reflection on my teaching. I didn't want it to look like I couldn't handle of uh, the classroom. And so, you know, I struggled to find strategies that might work, but they weren't necessarily evidence-based. What was it like when you came on board and uh, was your school already moving in this direction towards mental health education or did you have to bring it from scratch? Maybe Dr. McCoy, do you want to tell us where you started? Sure, sure. Let's start with my uh, previous district. So in Jennings uh, in 2016. Um, so actually, I was the youngest superintendent in the state uh, of a school district over 2000 students when I was at Ferguson Florissant at 14,000 students. And Michael Brown Jr. was my freshman student uh, who the mm. world for having been murdered and passed away uh, uh, and, and laid on the ground for four hours um, until he was you know, taken and the community saw it in March. And so uh, right as that occurred, I was in California as a superintendent in residence in Irvine. However, I was called to come back because of the mental health work that I started in Ferguson before Michael Brown's death. I got called to come back and I came right next to Ferguson Florissant, which is Jennings School District, which serves part of South Ferguson, all of Jennings and a part of the city. And uh, frankly, so having had experience with it in the past, having started a school-based health clinic in Ferguson, Florissant, uh, having had physicians and therapists in that setting uh, at McClure High School, that then led to me uh, coming to Jennings and literally having every school have um, that same vision, two therapists, uh, a school-based clinic at the elementary and, and, and high schools, um, the only district with the dentistry, uh, with mental health, and then eventually uh, therapists dedicated for teachers due to secondary trauma. So when we began in 2016, the, the district knew that there was a need for this. Uh, I often say this, you know, students of poverty are suffering from many epidemics before there was a pandemic. The pandemic just made everyone aware that when something happens, uh, you know, we we all need to work together to create a system to let us to help us get through it. But pandemics occur like every two hours, one black male expires. More than one black male expires every two hours. That's an epidemic. That epidemic requires a infrastructure that has uh, what I call centers for healing engagement, because often this is a lot of uh, either black on black uh, incidences of homicide or uh, in the case of Michael Brown, police authority uh, against African-American males uh, and African-Americans. So in either case, you have to have de-escalation centers. You have to be a center for de-escalation and a center for healing engagement, a center for guided imagery, meditation, yoga. Uh, and so when I began those practices, even voluntarily for the staff in country club settings on at happy hours with a <laughs> Peace circles, they fell in love with it and they said, We need more. 
Uh, we had a needs assessment occur to see what needs were in the homes of our children, but also within our staff uh, from, do I not wanna teach because my dog died to uh, I just experienced a divorce and I just don't have the substance within me. You can't lead on empty. And so you ultimately have to help fill people's cups with the appropriate life coaching to, to navigate life's waters. And so that was the beginning of our journey. How do you fill your cup with life coaches throughout life's journey? Oh, I love that. That's the kind of support teachers absolutely need that. If we're gonna model it, we need to be experiencing it. And I couldn't agree more. And it sounds like a lot of trauma um, for the staff as well as the students, of course. And I, I think it's really interesting that you started with mental health centers, not only at the high school, where I think a lot of us traditionally would think about this, but the elementary as well, because we know getting the kids the right foundation, learning those coping skills early is going to be key. Dr. Johnson, what was it like when you came on board? Chaotic, uh, people not paying attention to the data and the information that was obviously there. And and I would, sometimes, I would also sometimes say it was a lack of curiosity, a lack of trying to understand what was the basis for what we were observing. And I, I would say that, you know, and I also hesitate, and I'm very careful about when I talk about the mental health model we put in place in Minneapolis, it wasn't to suggest that all kids were mentally ill. It was to suggest that our kids need strategies, you know, de-escalation, they need to know how to be how to self-regulate and do things that were necessary for them to be successful in school, as well as to acknowledge the fact that some of the episodic things that Dr. McCoy talked about were taking place within the school. So what are the antecedent behaviors? What are the things that you're doing to trigger these behaviors from students, especially when you can see it happening in one classroom and not in another classroom? So I knew I needed to do something systemic. And my strategy was to start with also, I started with my K-8 schools, my kindergarten, my pre-K through eighth grade schools. And we look for mental health therapists within the community. We want them to be people that look like the students that they served. And quite frankly, we didn't always have a lot of those folks available, but what it did is to push those organizations to start hiring and more diverse uh, therapists to come into the schools. And what it provided is uh, a way for the therapists to to be more intentional, working with teachers on strategies for the entire classroom, not just with specific students. And actually, I feel like I, I know, but I don't have any data to suggest this. This is why data collecting is really important to talk about what Dr. McCoy talked about. The fact that matters, I know some, some teachers will pull a therapist aside, like, how could I get this help for me? We didn't provide that, but we certainly wanted folks to take advantage of our our uh, EAP program, uh, e EAP, I think that's the name of uh, employee assistance program yeah. that existed for them. But I would say that what was most disturbing to me is when a student was having an episodic behavior. And the first thing to do was to call the police because they could take them to like a day treatment, take them to the hospital to get them put into day treatment. And to me, that just was not okay. It just was not the way to go about addressing the needs of a student who had who was experiencing trauma, whether they're bringing it into the schools or there was something happening in the schools that, that made it happen. And going back to Dr. McCoy, I should let you know, my high school students, when Michael Brown laid in the street, they walked out, they laid in the halls for the same amount of time that Michael Brown laid in the streets. So that happened in Ferguson, but the impact was still felt with my students in Minneapolis. And so having those, those services and support and teams to go out to work with students to help them process this information is really important. That's why having a strong relationship and collaboration with these outside agencies really matters for school districts. You can't go it alone. You can. So true. I, you know, I think you started with a great point there, Dr. Johnson, that it's not that all students are mentally ill. When we talk about mental health education or services for students, I think we like to think of it as a force multiplier right? It's helping you to be able to be your most successful and right. really live up to your potential because we all experience challenges. There's Absolutely. not a person that's going to go through life without experiencing challenges. So do we know how to best operate under those conditions? Have we learned the skills? Because a lot of these are skills 
that right. have to be taught. And, um, and you're talking to that, you're speaking to that. And by starting earlier, whether it's, you know, pre-K and social emotional learning, whether it's um, having the wellness center right there, being able to do that outreach to families. Uh, I think that this will be really key for changing the way we think of schools as a place for the a whole person, not just your academic success. Right. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you were able to determine that the mental health needs of students of color were not being appropriately met. I, you spoke to that a little bit about how, you know, students were being taken to uh, for treatment by police and that might be further traumatizing, but maybe what kinds of policy changes did you make to help meet the mental health needs of black and brown students? Dr. McCoy, do you yeah, want to start? Definitely, this? definitely. Within our school-based health clinic, we required an assessment every time a kid walked in the door. So they would data collection to the home environment, the classroom environment, because in many cases, students uh, were dismissed from class for uh, issues that were uh, that what I would call fall in the gray area of respect and compliance, not something that's black and white, like you stabbed me, you punched me, <laughs> but more so right. I, I, you responded to me and now I, I disagree, let's get you out. And so the data collection through the health-based school clinics helped us to know so much. I was shocked when the data collection from the health-based school clinics showed that 80% of the kids coming into the, the uh, clinic uh, and even our nurse's office were asking for food, which was showing home from the house by 9.30 in the morning. That data collection was like, it, it showed us a picture of their uh, of their ecosystem, their world, and their issues. Kids are hangry, right? Oh, they're hangry. I understand that. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, so we yeah, so we leaned into that and it helped us greatly. We did a community needs assessment, but here's another thing that I often uh, advise people to do in any role: you have authority, you have you have right. authoritative power, and you have influential power. So use that influence to get people to do something extra. Use that authority to create something extra. Every time I had a student death or a staff death, for that matter. I created a program in memory of that person that helped to address that issue to help it not, not ever happen again. And so you mentioned, Amy, about preschool, uh, and, and we started a preschool through third grade mental health program. Uh, where the, we were the first in Missouri to pilot it, the third in the country, and that was just two years ago when we piloted called Parent-Child Interaction Therapy with a psychiatrist, helping to do three to four things create boundaries in the environment that the child knows I can't go past it. To create belonging, a sense of belonging. Here's my role, this is my purpose. So you don't have temper tantrums and spats and, and you know kicking and screaming and spitting and so forth. And then to create some ultimately a sense of, of, of true belief in yourself, belief in yourself and, and understanding the, the good expectations that go beyond, beyond your family environment's teachings because people don't know what they don't know. And so that's parent-child interaction therapy where a, a psychiatrist literally had a bug in the ear of the parent and was coaching the student in the middle of the downs on how to do that. Then we took it to the teacher level because let's be frank, the majority of teachers are middle-class individuals and the majority are women and you're dealing with uh, over 50% of people who are not that, over 50% of color, over 50% over 50 male, and so you needed teacher-child interaction therapy for pre-K through third grade. And those forms of tips, tools, and techniques of the four to five Bs uh, made a big difference uh, to stay on that theme of Bs. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so data collection is key and then creating something to not have the, the tragedy or the repeat right. of epidemics, that's, that's essential. So I'm gonna jump in, I mean, if that's okay. I'm with Dr. Yeah. Art. I think when you're talking about the bees, I'm gonna talk about um, the bee. Well, the reason that I got to this, I had a really smart school support person who tapped my shoulder and said, you know, we need to do something different. The fact of the matter is we rewrote our whole behavior policies because we also were collecting data. The majority of suspensions of kids being pushed out of the learning environment, which for our earliest learners shows that school is not the place for you to be. So we're socializing kids to see that school is not for you so why do I want to be there? 
So we took out the we took out the subjective ways of suspending kids, uh, disrespect, disobedience, all the things, all the, the triple D's that I now can't draw the third D. And the fact of the matter is, is that we saw that happening all the time. Kids were being pushed out of the learning environment, and then they would come back, and the behaviors would continue. We hadn't addressed the behaviors. We hadn't given given teachers strategies. So we required that our mental health providers provide like 20% of their time to professional development for the entire school staff. So that was everybody, teachers, the specialists, everybody in the school got that professional development. And then the assessment that you did with the individual students working with their parents, then the teacher got specific strategies. Another thing that came up was this whole thing around confidentiality, data privacy. So the information went to only the teacher that needed to know and the parent, because keep in mind, I was dealing with an issue that was really prevalent, prevalent, prevalent that our parents and families had this kind of fear of mental health. I mean, this whole thing about mental health uh, being a strategy was not something that people believed in. And so we had to break down those barriers. But going out and talking to the faith-based communities, talking to the community at large, parents, I mean, all the things Dr. McCoy is shaking his head to, you cannot do this in isolation in your office and you know and just say and decree it but the authority and the influence it absolutely you have to use that i served i sat on my academic leadership team every week i felt like that was a priority because academics was what our business a core of our business and i looked at every suspension not personally but i had my academic team we looked at every behavior referral across the entire system pre-k through 12 we read them and we found something alarming. We found that for the same student, for, for the same school, the same behavior, we saw different outcomes. So if you're a white student that did something, I had 70% students of color. If you're a white student that did something, then there were you know excuses like, oh, his parents are going through a divorce, or he was promised a trip to France and they're not going now, some of those kind of things. If you're a black student, you know they're just disobedient, they're bad, they're inherently bad. They don't know how to follow directions. And so that dichotomy of what we thought of our kids, I felt also played out in what happened. So you saw students being suspended in droves, pushed out of the learning environment. And we started to be able to look at the data for every student that was suspended, especially in ninth grade. If a kid was missing school in ninth grade, we knew right away that kid would have a less of a chance of graduating from high school. So how do we change some of that? And the Office of Black Male Student Achievement was about just that the negative narrative, all the messages that you hear about black males in, in, your, in our community and nationally, how do we reverse those and give our sis, students a sense of pride with their accomplishments and try to reverse those messages that make them feel like they are not worthy of praise and engagement and support. And right. oh my gosh, I'm so happy you all invited me and Dr. Arthur here. I really uh, yeah. really. Yeah, I Really Dr. important. She's a trailblazer. She's a trailblazer because I recall going to LA to help institute the same Center for African American Males a year after yeah. you started. So you were doing stuff that really everybody began to model. So thank you for, for your thank leadership. You. Thank you. Well, we need your advice. What advice do you have for state education agencies as they're planning reopening as it relates to mental health, the school, community, educators, staff, students? and even reaching their families. I love that you said going into faith communities, getting out the message, even when maybe families are a little hesitant to uh, right. about yeah. these practices. What, what advice do you have for those agencies thinking about what it could look like as we try to use this opportunity to transform education? Well, what I would say about agencies Quite frankly, even our, here in Minnesota already, they've been out talking about how do we use the resources that we've got. Yeah. They come with a plan already and not a plan that not, does not represent the actual needs of the institutions that they are supposed to be supporting. And so again, getting out, talking to the people, looking at the data and the research, not being confused by it, not, being, not ignoring it, and making sure that like Dr. R said, this is uh, this pandemic has affected all of us. So what's important is that we create opportunities for people to reteach how to do school. And we know teaching to students how to do school is a, is a white way of doing school, to be honest. And we also know that relationships really matter. 
And so anything we can do to teach and help our teachers who want to do the best they can, help them get the skills and the resources that they need to build the, their own individual capacity, but the capacity of the schools and the organization to meet the, students, uh, the, the needs of students. And I happen to sometimes be in a district, in a state that doesn't believe that mental health is, an, is a, a need. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't believe it's a need, you're not gonna go out and ask about it. And so that's a challenge that I think we have to get over. And so our legislators and superintendents and other people have to show up and talk and express what they need. And sometimes they don't, the people don't get a chance to do that. And so I, I just know that it's, a, it's worthy work and it's challenging, but it's doable. Yeah, definitely. I, and my advice would be, and I know we have about three minutes left. Uh, oh. My advice would be to, to, to ultimately incentivize through policy uh, collaboration. So that you know, in our system, we had about 20 agencies wrap around us uh, with wraparound services, and those agencies received money, uh, which would be like CARES Act money now, but it was a it was a children's fund created. They received money to support the district that had the identified needs with the greatest amount of uh, of challenges, both in the home environment, but also in the school environment. So, so in your policies, focus on the ABCs and the ABCDs academic achievement or the lack thereof, then support them with support. And, and I don't call it mental health as much as I call it life coaching to address the stigma mm. of mental health. So when you say life coaching, everybody wants a coach. Everybody understands who and what a right. coach does. You need a coach through life, just like you need a coach for basketball, baseball, lacrosse, and so forth. So the academic coaching, uh, then the behavior therapist, behavior interaction, parent-child interaction, that's all behavior, routine, mm -hmm. expectations, boundaries, borders, uh, patterns. And then the C, you need the C for individual character development, but also you need it for coach, a culture that makes each school a center for healing engagement. So we also tackled that suspension issue. And I said, just no more suspensions, period. For anybody right. through eighth grade, they all went to art therapy through in-school suspension, they all went to an alternative placement. If they had situations that, that were larger and safe schools violations with certified therapists there as a routine weekly wow. and life coaches regularly. But but the last place they need to be is at home. Right. <laughs> place that anybody, no, that doesn't work because they don't stay there anyway. And so, no. and, and then the D is of course, focusing on discipline strategies. That's the D. So you can often see that a person is crying out for help uh, and that a system needs structures if the discipline is out of whack. Absolutely. To the place. So that's the policy focus, the ABCDs, in my opinion, that we need to wrap around. I love that. Dr. Johnson, uh, when we spoke before, you kind of made the case for why schools are really a great place to address some of these. You talked about, um, you know, adherence to appointments and things like that. Maybe you could just give us that that last pitch on why school really does work as a place to meet some of the public health needs of our community. Well, yes, exactly. Because schools, that's the place where our students show up every day if they have great attendance. And the fact of the matter is, is that what we saw is when students had their therapy needs met at the school that they were more apt to make their appointments. They were more apt to be able to practice the skills that they were learning in therapy in real life, in real time. And so that is really, so it's not like you're going out and getting coached somewhere else. You get coached to play basketball on the hockey field. You're getting coached to play basketball on the court. And so that was really important. And it gave the therapist an opportunity to have time to connect with the child's teacher. Mm -hmm. And so it really provided this kind of a environment where the child could attend therapy, learn strategies, practice strategy, get feedback from the teacher, and it had the cyclical effect of really getting, making the students stronger and making the teacher stronger because keep in mind, even though she's learning this skill with a child, Brandon, I always use my kid's name, Brandon, she'll be able to use that same strategy with Brianna with another child. So she, the teacher's developing the skills that he or she can take on forward as well. And so having that mental-based model is really important and it takes some work, you know, work, space, all these things that people bring up as problems that this is when you have to use your authority. Forget the influence. You have to say, you will provide face, space for this. You will do this. And I think sometimes leaders, you know, because we talk about this collaborative leadership, we talk about this, but sometimes you just have to tell people what they have to do. And you can't be shy about it. You have to be forceful. 
for these reasons, we're doing this, this, and this, and you will do that, you know, that type of thing. Dr. McCoy knows what I'm talking about, you know, and so people, you know, Minneapolis, people don't like to be told what to do, but it really, well, I would say, yeah, but I would say that uh, we saw improvement in uh, suspensions, but disparity still exists. We mm -hmm. saw an improvement in outcomes, academic outcomes, but we also were able to identify things like when students were having academic challenges, like in reading, et cetera, they would act out. They act out to get put out of the classroom. So you have to meet the academic needs. And we got so good at, we knew if a child missed eight days of schools out of the learning environment, that that had an adverse impact on academic achievement, which we should know, but we knew it, it down to eight days, eight days of out of school had an adverse impact on mathematics because it's such a sequential content area. So collecting that data is really important. And this is such a good topic. I know we never have enough time. So no, I yeah. couldn't agree more. I love how it's just down to the details you were just collecting that data is so key. And thank you both for providing the models that really can provide that for so many other schools that are going to look for those public private partnerships for ways to bring uh, those health centers in, into their buildings or even just to start by collecting the data so they can display the need and demonstrate that the need is there and look for ways to build it out. I think you've uh, done a fantastic job highlighting and we could really get into and dive into all the many facets of how you've been able to address trauma-informed care in your schools and make a real difference for those students. But um, this was a great start. So thanks everybody for tuning in and thank you both for your expertise.